Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. This is Bill Strand, and welcome to an episode of The Outer Fringes where we explore reptiles outside of chameleons but are just as cool as chameleons and we want to know about. With me today is Josh Halter, who you may know as the Bio Dude. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bill. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, Today, everybody may think uh, we're going to be talking about bioactive substrates, which maybe that will be a future episode. We're going to be talking about another passion of yours, and that's the emerald tree skink. And, you know, looking at these things, it looks like uh, just a plain green lizard. What is the appeal of an emerald tree skink? Obviously, so their color is just ridiculous. So it's just a green lizard, but they're completely like smooth. But honestly, I'm taking color aside. It's their, their niches, their how intelligent they are, and how they associate themselves in groups and create a very unique hierarchy within your terrarium that is visibly noted in not only behavior, but in also breeding and seasons. Um, what's also really interesting about these guys is they're not hard to breed um, and you've got to keep them in groups to keep it short. You know, you can't just have one and if you have two, you want to make sure that it's, it's two girls. But ideally, for if you're going to keep them, you want a minimum of three um, to form their little congregation, so to speak. Um, and just like some other intelligent lizards like your green tree monitors, uh, they can be, you know, conditioned in specific ways with operant conditioning. So you provide a very specific type of stimulus, such as a food, to get the reaction or um, to get the action or reaction that you want, and they learn real quick. Um, and there are some lizards that you get that from, but not in the way that the emeralds do. They honestly remind me of miniature green tree monitors um, in the way of their intellect um, is concerned. But they also have that skink, that arboreal tree skink type of shared with their other people, the other types of skinks in their genus that like to be in groups. Um, yes. If if one is a, if one if you are keeping one by themselves, you will notice a distinct behavior change, whether it's how they're basking, how they're eating, where they're hiding, where they're sleeping, or they're constantly looking around. Uh, uh, they call it glass surfing. Um, there's a lot of different behaviors that you can notice that might point to you with this species that you may not be hitting that expectation for the husbandry that they require and that's another reason why i love these guys because there are some lizards that are like are like intelligent like them that have x y and z but they don't really tell you when you're not doing something right they hide it hide it hide it and by the time you realize that you've messed up <laughs> sometimes it's too late as a keeper to dig yourself yep. out of those holes yep. especially if they're wild caught which is pretty common for these guys. It's tough to get them acclimated, but that's why, you know, me and a couple other breeders around the country are really happy to offer captive bred multiple lineages and work together co collectively to make sure that we have a, di a continually diversifying bloodline to help establish captive populations in the United States. Yes, folks. Uh, this is something that is a little bit different for this podcast because usually I talk about chameleons and I keep saying, keep them separate, keep them alone. And people always want to put them together, but no, yeah. don't do that with chameleons. Well, I am bringing you a lizard today that can be, and Josh is saying should be kept in groups. And so yes. I am facetiously saying uh, just <laughs> a green lizard because there's nothing just about in emerald tree skink they are beautiful yes. and as we're going to learn now they're intelligent and social and so josh let's start at the beginning where are emerald tree skinks from so they are from you know in the regions of southeast asia namely the the, the philippines and in, 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 in indonesia 
So a lot of the times they are found towards the under canopy, the lower level of the under canopy. So they don't really go up past the bottom layer of the trees, at least it's what they say in the wild. So when they're collected via the wild, it's almost always off tree trunks on the side of like on the side of the base of the forest, but not on the ground. Um, you know, so you'll find them out all day because they are a diurnal species, which is another really attractive thing about these guys is because, you know, as as long as you're you have your lights for a proper sun up and sun down with dims, you know, once they like I said in our the last time I spoke to you, you know, we both know reptiles love schedules. They love schedules, mm -hmm. they love seasons, they like things to be as mimicked as best as possible. So when you provide that to them, you'll really notice if you're mimicking that area, you know, you notice how well of that they will do. Um, you know, typically in that environment, it's fairly humid. There's spikes throughout the day, goes down. Spikes throughout the day, goes down. And that's the same for your, for your temperature and your hu humidity. But they love opportunity. Uh, now, when I say opportunity, so using plants that have axles in them, such as epiphytes like bromeliads or maybe even some types of orchids or sansarias, things like that, that hold water in the axles. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't really like to, to stand still in their terrarium. They like to stay in their group and go area to area to area. Okay. And providing the different opportunity zones for thermoregulation and humidity regulation and all that stuff is is not that hard to do. You just, you have to do your research and spend the money to do it right. You know, these, the one thing I wanna get out of the way first, like chameleons, these are not a cheap animal. Um, they are very expensive to get set up because they need a lot of um, extensive lighting. Um, you can't have just one, so you need a very large enclosure. Um, and on top of that, you know, you gotta fill up that enclosure to make sure it's thick, lots of vegetation, lots of vines, things X, Y, and Z. Um, so that way they can, uh, you know, not just survive, but thrive. All right, so let's talk about this completely foreign concept to me and to some of my chameleon listeners. What do you mean by social groups? What do they do in social groups? And talk about that behavior, please. Yeah, so let me, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna give you two different arenas here. So the first group that I bought, I bought a group of unrelated babies. I bought Two babies from Sean Harrington, the Frog Whisperer. Done a lot of business with Sean. If you guys know who he is, look him up. He's a great guy. Um, and then I got another, I got another pair, pair of babies from my friend Mike Beaudry, the guy that helped me design my website. Uh, you know, he's he's been keeping these longer than I. Um, and then I also got, uh, I also got another older group from a rando at a herp show when I first moved down here. So essentially we went through the quarantine process and what I found was we ended up after the babies cleared quarantine, I put them together. And my baby mixture ended up being two males and two females. And I kept them in a 36, 18, 36. Then I got another, the other group that I bought was only a pair. And then another customer came along and was like, I got another adult, let me get you an adult. Uh, quarantine, did our whole vet check deworming because you just don't know. I'll get into mm -hmm. wild call with them a little bit later, but you gotta take your precautions. So I ended up having a, a group of four and a 36, 18, 36, and a group of three and a 36, 18, 36. The group of three ended up being three females and the group of four ended up being two males, two females. So the ones that were babies, okay, that grew up together, those males had no problem with each other. Those females had absolutely no problem with each other. And essentially, the biggest one whom we whom we named Gator, whom we still have. Um, Gator is a monstrosity of an emerald tree skink. He's about 25% larger than all the other ones. So he was always head honcho of that group. Okay, um, and during that time, when it comes to uh, them coming out of their tubes in the morning, guess who's always first to come out before the other ones? It's always Gator. Guess who's always at the highest spot of the basking? Uh, the, there's multiple basking spots that give them different levels of intensity. But guess who is always at the highest point 
at the hottest one. It was always Gator. And guess when we put in with the operant conditioning with showing a specific type of insect and having them follow onto the glass to be able to jump up on our shoulders, sit on our shoulders and eat worms out of our hand. Mm -hmm. The first one that would always come out was Gator. And if any of the other ones would attempt to try to come out first, Gator would go into them and do like a little, a little nose thing to move them out of the way. Not in a way that I'm gonna beat the crap out of you, but hey, I'm going first, not you. Mm -hmm. And when you see these different hierarchies form, that goes with breeding. Um, it goes with, so if, if, so when I ended up uh, having that other male in there, that other male, he never once bred with those girls, ever. Because it was always Gator that was just like, no, these biddies are mine. So what I ended up doing was I ended up pulling that extra male, okay? When I pulled out that male and put him in his own temporary to eventually introduce him in with the other adults, we then ended up having a little bit of a flamboozled with Gator, then started attacking the female that we, we, that we, that, that we, we never had an issue with. Like it was an extremely aggressive all the time breeding, which never happened before. So what we then, so then what we ended up doing was we ended up taking Gator out. I put the other male in back in cause I wanted to see what would happen. And that male, he didn't, it's like, it's like he was demoralized, neutered. Mm. He didn't want to, he had no, no desire to try and breed with the females in X, Y, and Z. So then after we let the girls recover a little bit, we took everything out of the enclosure and then we rearranged it. So that way, you know, we could formulate different territories, added an additional hot spot or three basking spots. There was three instead of two. Um, with a little bit more UVB exposure and put Gator back in there and the hierarchy went uh, pretty much completely back to normal. A week after that, I removed that extra male. So Gator and the two girls are currently in my showroom right now. And there's an extra girl in there and I'll go over into that later. Then we have our other group, okay? Now this hierarchy was a little different. This hierarchy was formed with just initial fighting. So when we, when we put them in their new enclosure, so we initially were keeping them in a 24, 18, 36, and they were in there for uh, about six months. So then I upgraded them to an Exoterra 36, 18, 36, okay? Um, new surroundings, new everything. Once they were put into that new surroundings, it was almost like a reset button hit. Um, and that's when the, and, and that's when the, the, and that's when the, the one that we had started to actually start interacting with the girls, uh, and like in the, in, in the tank. So I put that tank in the break room because what we were noticing was that group wanted significantly more human interaction. So when we walk past the, the cage in the break room, I wish I could show you. Those lizards go freaking crazy. Whenever the employees are in there eating lunch, they go crazy because they know that when people are in there for lunch, a lot of times that cage door is going to be opened. They're going to get to hop on someone's shoulder and get a snack. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's like that special tuning that they have. So, but those that highest level basking and X, Y, and Z in that group, we don't see anything like that. What we see is they are constantly together. Meaning like, meaning that that group, if they are basking under the light, all of them are basking and sharing that light. When they are sleeping in a cork bark tube, all of them are sleeping in a cork bark tube. But there isn't necessarily a, I go out first, you go out second, you go out third in comparison to the other group. So one thing I found that to be extraordinarily interesting because here I have Gator ended up, you know, being a little bit more of like a, we had to do a little bit more, you know, pay attention to him to make sure he wasn't going to hurt anything or hurt anybody mm -hmm. um, to, to get him established and continue the breeding and X, Y, and Z. Um, but he was always the first, no matter what. And 
that's kind of where we were happy with that. We, we let's fast forward a year. Okay, I don't want to like go too deep into it. Uh, Sean messages me and he has this lone female that is, she is almost, she has a silver purple hue. Adult okay. female emerald tree stain. So she has that green, but she literally has this crazy purplish silver iridescence. Never seen anything like it. I was like, yeah, dude, I'll take her. So he shipped her down to me, quarantined the whole process. And I ended up introducing her into the whole, into the group with Gator because I wanted to see how how my big boy, who's my most prolific breeder, would react to what appears to be an emerald with unique genes. Maybe not unique genes, but one that's just a little bit yeah. more beautiful than per se my other girls. And what we ended up getting was she wanted absolutely nothing to do with him the first 30 days that we were in there. Because what he was trying to do was he was constantly trying to breed her, to breed with her. If she would try to go up into the other basking spot where he was, he would take his little fat body over there and go to where she was and then try to do his thing. So when we were noticing that was happening, that's when we started to like try to feed extra and try to provide um, other things that, that might like uh, extra cork tube exactly. Um, to to help with the acclimation process so that it's not that it went bad but we were thriving for after we got over that hump we were doing okay. okay okay and then all of a sudden i come in one day and one of my original females i found on the ground she was beaten up to the point when she was almost dead oh no this was out of nowhere. I was like, what the heck is going on? I was like, I was like, Gator, what did you do? Pull her out. We get her, we get her work on getting her rehabbed. Come to find out it wasn't Gator that was doing it. It was the, it was the, it was the new addition of oh. that new emerald that we got because she wasn't fitting in as well to their initial hierarchy that I guess we thought that we had established already. So I was like, well, that's not good. So then we really watched her with the other female and she wasn't really messing with that other female, but that other female that she was picking on was a little smaller than her. So again, I, I, I'm not trying to go back and forth. So then what we ended up doing is we, I, I, I took her to my wife, you know, my wife got her, you know, better. And we kept her separate, recovered for about 90 days. I then introduced her into my other group. And now she is thriving with that group. So, you know, and still following those same tendencies that that other troop, I don't know if they're called troops, groups, whatever, but but when they come out in the mornings, it is, it is a synonymous exit. Okay. When they go down for the night, it is a, we're all gonna go in for the night. But comparison to the dictator gator, it is a completely different type of, system that they have in there so you know that could be attributed to with me when i look at that that can be attributed to well you know they're they're, they're just they're they just have a different type of you know social structure by the type of animals that are in there but you, as a keeper you then have to recognize how intelligent they have to be to be able to develop and endure different levels of socialization and hierarchy that goes with different groups in a captive environment. And then when you see those things in front of you, it's, it's, it's really, really rewarding. So essentially what I'm getting at is if you're getting a group of them, it's beneficial to get babies that are from different lines and okay. raise the babies up together because they are familiar with each other. But if you are introducing an adult from one bloodline, an adult from another bloodline, you really, really just want to watch how that how that happens to make sure that you're not kind of setting yourself up to lose one of to lose one of your girls because they're skinks. You know, you and I both know that male skinks don't like other male skinks. That's just that's just how it is. But there are times that especially given the enclosure size and if you have it set up right with visual barriers and multiple hotspots and x y and z that you can in good diet you can get away with it um so not trying to not trying to really digress here but one of the best things about having them as a pet 
is you can literally see that unfold in front of you that you don't, it's not that you don't get that from other reptiles because you definitely can, but it is a very unique way that that becomes established um, with different types of groups. And well, to me, like, to me, like, people try to compare animal intelligence to human intelligence thinking it's the same thing. And it's not. Animals are just really intelligent in a completely different in a completely different way. It's like, um, you know, besides you know, how different animals evolved to different environments, it's like, well, how did this bird know that if it did, if it hammers directly into this tree, it's going to get a very specific type of nutrient out of that out of that bark? You know, it's those special and evolutionary niches slash different evolutionary intelligences that you see that really come to light in a living terrarium with them in it, if that makes sense. All right, Josh, you just described a number of scenarios that some may listen to that and say, well, then why do we bother having them together? Let's just have them apart. So what is, uh, do they do okay apart? And why wouldn't that be an advantage to avoid all of this complication? So here's the, so you, one thing I will say is when we have emeralds for sale, so babies for sale, like we have a waiting list, I think of like 20 people. It's just, it just grows every single month. And when we actually, if we ever put babies out on the floor, there is a distinct, we here as the keepers, we notice a distinct difference between a baby being kept by itself and a baby being kept with a group. Now, I don't know if it, gives them a sense of security because there's strength in numbers um or if it's something that has to do with how they're wired but their activity level changes how they interact with you changes and their boldness changes um at least from what from what we've seen so if, if it's something that like I, I wasn't trying to like dissuade people from getting a group it's just like with any animal with any groups of animals that you have, you want to understand the sex that you have, the sex the sex group ratio that you have, and you also want to understand how those how those animals interact with each other. You know, I'm sure there's some breeders here in the country that end up keeping a group of females together, and then they'll just have a male, and then they'll put that male in with the girls when they actually want them to breed. I just never personally had tried that tried that approach because I just saw the benefits that they as animals got when they were being kept together i guess is 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 a is a easier is a good way for me to put that you know okay. can you keep one by itself and will it survive yes and can you still you know work with it and get you know those different types of reactions and things that you want out of them as a pet absolutely but just in the wild when you find them they're not by themselves typically like they're sure. you know from at least from my understanding you know you're gonna you see one oh look there's another one five feet away like, all right you are also talking about interaction with human beings to the point where they they want to come out could you explain what kind of relationship you can develop with this uh, uh this absolutely thing? so t babies are very 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 skittish as they should be they're delicate and when they come out of the, when they come out of the egg they are about as long as my earbuds are. When I started to work with them, the first thing that I would do is I would get them used to my fingers. Um, that's that's the very first thing. So when they're babies or adults, when I go in there to uh, change their water bowl or to spot clean or to change their glass or to make sure that their perches are still secure or to water the plants or whatever, I am always trying to get my fingers closer to them. So that way they can start understanding that, hey, you're not a threat, you're just here taking care of my environment. And then after I start, so initially they're gonna see your fingers and they're gonna go. Once you start noticing that, hey, I see my fingers, here's a three second pause, then I'm gonna go. Then you start adding in a reward. And that's when we started adding in wax worms, uh, or we take the, 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 the big blue goliath worms and we cut them up into pieces. Um, and then we put them in our hand and give them. 
So then what I would do is take a, take a, a live food item like waxworm, you hold on to them and they wiggle like a worm. Mm -hmm. And you hold them and I would hold it from them probably about 10 to 12 inches away. And as they start approaching you, I would move forward very, very slowly about two inches. And then they'd stop. And then if they run away, you try again your next interaction. Okay. And then after that, you just keep doing that. And before you know it, you'll be able to have a little waxworm in your hand and they will take it right out of your hand to okay. eat, eat right out of your hand. Every single one of my adult emeralds here, every single one is trained to eat out of my hand, out of my keeper's hands and my hand. Then we took it to the next level because uh, sometimes they get exorbitantly excited when we walk by especially the ones in the break room and they are so attuned to when we open up they get to the very front ledge that is at the same level as our shoulder <laughs> and they jump from the ledge onto the shoulder they go to the other shoulder and they sit here and wait to be hand fed <laughs> after they get their worms we go like this they jump out back into their cage so that took about six months of hand feeding and putting my hand flat out like this mm -hmm. with a food item a larger not so you want it to be a non-live food item and you want it to be larger because you don't want it to be really be moving because the reason you you want them to get the reward so essentially what i would do when they would come up on my hand i would have my hand be up in the tank so if they would jump off they're not going to fall on the floor and get hurt Mm -hmm. And once I knew that they were comfortable enough, I'd give them treats and then I would literally just go like this. And then after they understood the shoulder aspect, that's when we started doing straight cage to jump, cage to jump, cage to jump. Yeah, and like I said, it took, it took a while, but that, I really can't stress enough, like that human animal bond can be formed with these guys very strongly. Um, and whether that's because they have a level of intelligence or whether it's just because of how they are, they're just an extremely inquisitive species. Every inch of terrarium you give them, they will use it. They will, they will utilize every single inch. And like we use trees in their enclosures, like literal trees, because it's, that's what they need. Like I think their one enclosure has a ficus tree that takes up two thirds of their enclosure. It's just a giant, it's just a giant tree. We have a nice, nice deep layer of firma in there. Um, and my girls lay eggs in the enclosures. We don't pull the eggs. And we come, we come in in the mornings and there's baby emerald tree skinks in the enclosure. Oh, that's um, great. And we have, so it depends on your group dynamic. If you have a big boy who's a dictator like Gator, you gotta pull the babies. Because he'll, he'll like he'll he'll kill. Him. Um, or if you have the other group like I have, you can leave the babies in there until they are about to reach sexual maturity, and then that's when you gotta really start looking at okay, I got females, I got males, or I don't want to dirty up my bloodline too much, blah blah blah. So you know the the cage in the break room, man. We leave babies and we've left babies in there for weeks or months at a time. Um, but you know, comparison to like the cage with Gator, the moment we see a baby in there, we're like, oh, you're so cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Type of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then we end up, you know, we usually set up the babies in an 18, 18, 24, uh, with, you know, full UVB, full heat, uh, misting system, uh, just because they, when they're babies, they're, they're so delicate and they dehydrate very, very fast. Uh, so, you know, it is really helpful, uh, yep. you know, to be able to, you know, A, identify your group to see if you have, you know, a big meanie or if you can just kind of let them in there. Example, Michael's group that he has, he has two or three bloodlines from different importations. And he has, a, I know he has one massive cage and he has a pair. He has a lone pair in there that has close to 15 to 16 babies in it that he has in a massive cage that he has just let them grow into the troop mm -hmm. so he so that's kind of how he built one of one of his groups up was just he just held back some of his babies and then mixed them up x y and z but 
you know, when I end up having a giant long waiting list and, you know, we want to get some other types of bloods, bloodlines, especially for some of my clients that now bought babies for me that now are adults and they want to breed. And I'm like, well, let's let's work on getting you some of, some of the line that we got from Harrington, some of the line we got from Mike, some of the line we got from me, um, and make sure that we keep it keep it clean okay. uh and you know that's that's really that's really cool too uh that watch him be able to have babies grow up like that um in that enclosure all right well let's say we're interested and now we know what now we want to know what is it going to take so what kind of cage should we be considering if we want to get yep. into emerald tree skinks Yep, so the minimum size for a single is an 18, 18, 24 for a sub-adult. That is too small for anything older than a year. A, a minimum for a pair, so I'm not even gonna go single. A minimum for a pair is gonna be 24, 18, 36. Okay. Do not bother with anything smaller because they're, they're just it's just not gonna work as well as you think it will. Um, we keep ours right now in a 36, 18, 36, but we actually just, Zach just built me a new cage, uh, that is three and a half by three and a half by six and a half. Okay. That's uh, good. and it's going to be fully automated and everything. So that's actually going to be in the center of my showroom. So the group that, that Gator's in, I'm going to be pulling him out, him and his girls, out of that 36, 18, 36, and I'm likely gonna be setting them up in that really large enclosure, just because, you know, they, they deserve it. Uh, okay. You know, but I digress. A 36, 18, 36 for up to four is, mm -hmm. is what I'd say that you can comfortably get away with right now when it comes to commercially available cages. If you want to go with like a Zen, ha uh, like a like a cage, like Zach built, like a PVC cage or Zen habitats or whatever, really you want to use, the most important thing is airflow. Uh, these guys need really, really, really good airflow. They do not do well with stagnant air like chameleons. So they don't need a screen cage, but because of their humidity ranges that need to happen throughout the day, and the same thing with their temperature ranges. It's not that it's hard to accomplish in a PVC cage. You just, you really have to watch your parameters by, you know, potentially using technology to aid you in that. So like computer fans, thermostats, uh, hygrometers, things like that. So that way you can make sure that you're getting those variants because PVCs can be a little bit tricky when it comes to airflow. Uh, okay. But as far as height, they are an arboreal diurnal species. So you wanna make sure that uh, they have the ability to climb like they are in the end, the, at the, the beginning of the under canopy of a tree. That's okay. essentially what you wanna mimic. They don't ever go onto the ground unless A, the girls are gravid and wanting to lay eggs. Two, there isn't a good place for them to sleep up in their thing, i.e. there's no cork tubes or nothing hollow that they can fit their little fat bodies into collectively as a group um or c your cage is just not humid enough and they have to dig down into the substrate to rehydrate themselves okay. um which when it comes to babies that you'll like be like where is my baby where did it go you're looking all above and then you lift up all your leaf litter and you'll see the the, the little cute monster in a little ball sleeping under the leaves because it's really humid in that microclimate to help keep their shedding and respiration and hydration where it needs to be and that's like to me one of the most three essential concepts of reptile keeping you know uh when it comes to like what has to do with water um you know so, i want to say I, you talk about this these interaction and maybe i just step back do we know what benefit being in a group has for them in the wild why did they develop this you know that's really interesting to you ask that i wish i could say i know for sure but like you look at other members of like other skinks look at look at a uh, monkey tail skinks monkey tail skinks on the solomon islands you know they they literally bond for life once they breed they are together forever then the baby that they have that they give live birth to they raise up that baby for like three years as a family 
And then when that baby is ready to leave and find its own group, they're like, peace. And then they send him on his own way. Whether it's a, I don't know, it could be argued that potentially it's a survival niche that they have, strength in numbers. Um, it could be that it's easier to, it's easier to breed and the aspect of there's more available types of, you know, things. But then again, out in the wild, I don't know how often, you know, I'm sure there's a male, this is my trunk of the tree. This isn't yours. If you come in here, I'm gonna kill you type of thing. Um, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that, that type of happens, um, that type of thing happens. I just, uh. I don't know. It's just, it's just like, it's just for some reason, like there are some types of reptiles that just seem to, it just seems to be their innate instinctual drive to be with others of their own kind consistently okay. and not just for breeding. And, you know, I really hope to have monkey tails one day. I'm not trying to, not trying to digress. I just, I always found that to be really fascinating that you have a reptile that literally bonds for life. Yeah. You know, and you know, birds do that. Mammals do that. You don't. You don't really hear about reptiles doing that. And then that right. circles back to the different levels of intelligence that they have and understanding and nurturing. I guess that intelligence in a in a in the captive environment. Okay. So, what does the inside of a cage need to have for these guys to be happy? Yep. So I'm, you know me, I, you need to have, if you're not gonna go bio, you gotta have naturalistic then. Um, you must have trees. And right, now when I say trees, so not everybody can go to the store or order from me to get a ficus tree or a chefalera tree. What you need are a, a, is a tree or shrub that is branchy and the aspect of wherever that lizard goes, A, it can handle the weight it's not mm -hmm. going to break and snap. Number two, that uh, the substrate that you're using, you need it to be, you know, deeper because when the girls want to lay their eggs, you got to have deep substrate, you know, and that and if you're using large plants, large plants have a very extensive root system. So to maintain that root system, you need to have a lot of soil. So it's just something that we're, you know, talking about to or that's something that you know that you really want to have in there. Uh, we love using cork tubes towards the top of the enclosure to work our way down. Um, and a lot of times towards the bottom end of the tubes, I'll stuff spag moss in half of it that stays wet. So that way that humidity shoots up the tube, but it's also near the heat bulb. So then inside that tube, you have different levels of sauna that they can utilize to help with shedding, respiration, and hydration. Um, so there's cork tubes, uh, like ficus tree, chefalera tree, and then I use a lot of epiphytes. So things like bromeliads, uh, and then ground plants like that are tall, like sand servias, uh, as well as, you know, pothos. I like those because A, they're easy to grow, Two, they take up, they're bushy and take up a lot of real estate. So these guys, they like, they don't mind being seen by you, but when you're not there, they want to feel secure in their environment. It's no different than when somebody buys a screen cage and puts a single stick mm -hmm. in it with one, with one fake plant you know, that you stick to the back of the cage, hang it on there, put a chameleon in it. Yeah. And you know, every second that that chameleon's in that cage, it's scared to death. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's it's just like, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna get picked yeah. off by a bird or something's gonna happen. You know, these guys, I'm not saying that's the same, but when you build their cage, they like it to be crowded. They like a lot of opportunity zones when it comes to hydration and respiration and, you know, your gradients and they like to have lots of levels. So when I build their enclosure, it kind of goes yes, like yes. I have a branch, 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 but it's all about the different levels because sometimes they might not want a 98 degree hotspot. They want a 90 degree hotspot. So it allows them to go a little bit lower to kind of get to kind of get where they want so they can thermoregulate exactly. So, um, crowded enclosure, lots of plants, lots of branches, deep substrate. 
Okay. What do they use to bask on? And, and what I'm getting at is what kind of perching surface is comfortable for them? So they love basking in the tree. Gotta be honest with you, there is a portion of that tree that is just sticks because it is directly like near the heat bulb. Uh, and they like to literally stick their little heads right above where those leaves break, like right mm -hmm. where they're, I can't remember what that organ is. And they literally just, <laughs> and they'll just sit there and do their thing. But what they don't like are really weak, wobbly branches. Okay. Um, so stirred, like, so like the sturdy cork bark, uh, the sturdy cork bark, uh, branches are good. We tried bamboo with them. They did not like it because they do not have the sticky fingers. They only okay. have claws. So it's not that they couldn't climb the bamboo when it's vertical because it's super smooth. They just weren't as good at it, I guess, is, 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 the, is the way to put it. They were pretty clumsy with okay. it. So uh, as long as the wood that you're using is porous, that their little nails can dig into, that'll be okay for when it comes to like whatever type of basking surface that, that you wanna use. How about the temperatures between uh, day, basking, and nighttime? Yep, so the highest it will ever get is 98, but it only maybe reaches that point for maybe an hour a day. Uh, so average, a hot spot of between 94 to 92, uh, that's what it will average be throughout the day. Um, okay. And then the low, the cool end of the tank is always room temperature around 70 degrees. At okay. nighttime, that's when we start working, you know, your dimmers and everything else. And that's when you want, uh, you know, for it to be, no, honestly, I've been keeping them and breeding them at room temperature at night with no hot spot, uh, except when it's winter here uh, and it gets a little chilly. And that's when I'll run a ceramic heat emitter to get some of those infrared C waves. It's just enough to get into the subcutaneous tissue, but it's not enough to create a full blown crazy hot spot like uh, like a halogen's gonna do um, with you know your A your A and B waves. That's what I found to be extremely effective. Uh, we right now, as far as heat is concerned, uh, we are running Arcadia halogens uh, as well as Arcadia UVB. I do recommend a T5, uh, 6%. Uh, that's about what we've been using. I think that's around a Ferguson zone one and a half. I gotta look at my chart, but mm -hmm. that's right around like this, The it's right above the shade dweller, but okay. not in that like oppressive desert, you know, beam of light. So, um, that's what that's what we've been using. We replace the UVB fixtures every year. Just make sure when you guys do the fixtures, you don't touch the bulbs with your hands because the oils on your skin damage the UVB bulbs. Okay. Um, and we have, uh, we try to match, my showroom is matched with what's going on here outside. So we just went in the daylight savings time. So all of my timers should have, I gotta, gotta check with Amber on that, should have been adjusted on yesterday to match what we're doing outside because dude, I'm all about mimicking seasons. Uh, I'm about mimicking it as close as we possibly can because uh, we just found that the animals thrive better. So we have everything on a timer uh, from the heat down to the, to the UVB uh, as well as the Miss King system. And the Miss King system uh, we have going off for 25 seconds a session twice a day. And we do okay. it right when the sun, right when the sun, right, right as the sun, the lights are supposed to turn on. So like there's dew, um, and then about an hour before the sun goes down, we'll okay. it, it'll it'll get a it'll get a decent mist. All right, and that's worked really well for us. Well, let's talk about humidity values. I mean, you touched on humid uh, hydration a little bit, but uh, let's yep. talk about some values for day and night. Yep. So as far as nighttime is concerned, their their humidity uh, after it mists, uh, it usually goes to about 55%. And then about two hours after that, it stays typically right around 45% throughout the bottom of the enclosure with it being a little bit dry on the top because all the water goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, but during the day, that's when we'll try, that's when with the heat, 
that's when we'll notice, especially in the tubes, uh, that humidity will jump up to 75% to 80% for about two hours. Um, and then it'll slowly decrease. And then we'll, it'll shoot up for a little bit and then it'll slowly decrease. The general rule of thumb for these guys, you don't want them to be above 80% humidity consistently. Just like any other lizard, you know, airflow is extremely important but you also want to make sure uh, that, you know, it's just not constantly wet and right. sappy right. in their enclosure all the time, because then it's just, it's just not gonna work out for you. Uh, so as long as you are kind of giving them that swing throughout the, like, you know, each day, they'll do okay. Babies, however, babies have a different schedule because they dehydrate 10 times faster than the adults. We have them on a Mist King that goes off 15 seconds per session four times a day. Mm -hmm. And we have a bulkhead built into the bottom of that enclosure for the drainage layer because if I didn't, the drainage layer would fill up in like a week. Yeah. And then I'd have to sit there and drain it every single week. I don't want to do that. So yeah, that's just, that's what we found that worked for us. We are also in Texas. So we're in Houston, so it's pretty freaking tropical here. So we're kind of like up at, a, at an advantage. But if I get these guys where I'm from up in Pennsylvania in the winter time, dude, I'd probably have to have that Miss King go off four times a day for the adults to get that same type of range because it's so darn dry up there. Yeah. So you know the most important thing is that you just understand what they need parameter wise and then you're gonna have to play with it a little bit to see what works best for you to get the results that you need they mainly eat soft-bodied insects but they will also eat a fruit-based diet occasionally as long as it is enriched with Interesting. like insects so we feed them the babies, the babies, uh, we, we, we follow this rule of thumb. Nothing bigger than the space in between their eyes. Because okay. just like baby leopard geckos, baby red eye tree frogs, X, Y, Z, with crickets, the spurs on their legs can cause esophageal tears if you are not, if you give them one that's too big. Um, I don't, is, is that how it is with, with young cha chameleons as well? Like Jackson's and Vales and stuff? Uh, generally, that's the same size that we go with. Uh, we don't, we have more of a problem of them trying to take in something too big and then, uh, choking on it. Oh uh, it is, it is rare for that to happen. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, you look at a chameleon, they have this huge mouth, and yeah. there really isn't that big of a throat there. So Yeah, and the uh, mouth's <laughs> all for tongue. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, and they chew, chew them up pretty good. So, uh, But the uh, the measurement between the eyes, yes. that's, that's the same way for chameleons. Okay. So, so that's our first principle. The other principle is, A, everything's gut loaded. So we gut load everything here with my bug rub. Uh, and bee pollen uh, and carrots, essentially those three things is what we rotate. Uh, babies are are fed uh, small eighth inch crickets, baby, and I mean baby doobie roaches. We cut up wax worms in half and give them cut up wax worms and or silkworms. Okay. We are all about a varied diet here at BioDude. Uh, the adults, same thing, but add goliath worms into that mix, uh, as well as uh, red runner roaches. So we kind of, Monday through Friday, they are fed a different thing. Um, as, they, um, as they are younger, we cup feed. So we will put the roaches and the crickets in an eight ounce deli cup in the enclosure. Um, or what we will do is take my bug rub and set gut loader to its wet form. And we, when it's a wet form, it turns into Play-Doh. And it, we, we create feeding stations out of it. So neonatal animals don't have to expel a lot of energy to catch their food. It's great for small dart frogs and stuff like that. So I'll literally take a small thing of bug rub, I'll put it in the tank. Okay. And then the isopods, the roaches, the crickets will swarm that ball of bug rub and then the little lizards just come up and grab them and then they do their little head thing when they rub it up against everything to pull it into pieces and then they eat it. 
Um, and then the adult, so the babies are fed every single day. The adults are fed every other day. Uh, and uh, we have a, a supplement rotation. Since they are given UVB, we do not supplement D3. Uh, okay. So right now we are uh, we are using the um, the Retcal No D3 uh, because I mean I've been using that for years and it's never never steered me wrong. And then we are also using the Rapashi multivitamin. We also supplement uh, with bee pollen. So uh, the one day that we are not uh using a multivitamin or calcium we will dust with bee pollen and or astaxanthin and astaxanthin is a is a carotenoid uh it doesn't do much for them in the aspect of bringing out color so it naturally brings out your yellows and your reds and like your frogs and your other you know crested geckos and stuff like that you can also use paprika if you if you downgrade it in with something else so it's not spicy to eat uh, but we sprinkle that in because carotenoids in general are a big role with how reptiles synthesize vitamins. If you if they don't have the specific carotenoids, they're not able to break down and utilize the vitamins and things that we're giving them. That you um, said something interesting. You said you sometimes cut up hornworms and feed those. Yes, so you're talking will. about uh, they're eating something that doesn't move. Yeah, and almost every single time, that's after they know to take food from our fingers. Okay. So right. when I say, like, we add hornworms to that mix, the adults, those adults, I mean, dude, I can give an adult, I like, I can give Gator a medium-sized hornworm, and he will be a very, very, very happy lizard. Um, <laughs> you know, but what I'm finding is that if I give these, if I give the girls... Uh, a medium-sized goliath worm they will literally all try to eat it and then they'll just rip it into shreds because the one has like oh i want it too and then they'll grab the other and the other one will grab the other and they pull it three ways and then they'll just destroy it which is fine but it makes a mess and then we have to sometimes clean it up because that's how you can get flying insects and stuff mm -hmm. in the cage and you don't want that. so I, I digress. So yes, when we hand feed them, if I don't have wax worms or I just don't want to make them morbidly obese, because um, wax worms are super, super fatty, um, they're like a good get me up food if we are like immunocompromised or I uh, need to put on some weight or we just had eggs, something like that. But the horn worms, man, we just cut them up into little pieces and put them on our fingers or put them on the tongs and they just take them and run off with them. Okay. And they love them. How challenging is it to breed the emerald tree skink? It's not hard. I gotta be honest with you. Every single person that I've sold a group to has been successful breeding them. Okay. What it comes down to is understanding your hierarchy in that cage and how it works and being able to diagnose if there's a problem to make sure that either A, you redo the cage or B, you remove and do a reintroduction after new territories have been established with the ones that weren't fighting. Um, and after that, it's it's pretty consistent. I'm fair, the gator's enclosure, I know there's at least 10 to 12 eggs in that enclosure. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that they just, like, literally, like, you look in that enclosure, and I can take my thumb and just plop them into little prairie dog holes all throughout the substrate, because the firma retains all tunnels and burrows that they make. So there's literally a little network of penny-sized with tunnels throughout that entire throughout the entire enclosure now the break room enclosure i don't know because that group is so sporadic and all over the place because really they don't really care about breeding they literally just want to be on your shoulder or to be fed <laughs> all the time like all the time so okay you know okay so what's the reproductive process so uh essentially what i notice is the girls will kind of you know accept what's happening with gator um or the or the other male um i would love to tell you i know how long they have their eggs from breeding to laying i have personally never seen my girls lay them mm -hmm. i have seen them go into the burrows and disappear for a day or two which then i can correlate yeah we're probably in there laying our eggs or we're trying to hide from something um, but I know that when they lay their eggs, I think 
it's typically about 90 days. Okay. That's where I failed to help others because I should be pulling the eggs and being like, okay, it takes 90 days, 120 days for incubation. But I just, because my tanks are thriving and everything's so great, like I don't waste my time. I just leave them in there and then uh, they just, they just show up. Like, so I don't, I don't want to like, I don't want to, I don't want to fix something that's not broken. There are two aspects of this. One is knowing all of the, uh, all of the, this information about the species, but then there's the herpeticultural aspect of being able to take care of the environment enough that they just do what they're experts at and you yep. take care of the environment. And that's where I'd like to see all of us to go. That's how it should be for everything yeah. we keep. <laughs> yes, I believe yeah. so. Yeah, so, but it's not even close. Yeah, we're getting there though. So, uh, you know what? We can Google the information about the gestation and incubation. I just tell people, understand the hierarchy, make sure your husbandry's right, build your cage like mine, you will be successful. Yeah. And yeah. Like I, I like the my one client, she has she has the blood all the bloodlines that I have now and hers are breeding like crazy. It's amazing. Okay. It is absolutely amazing to see and you know, she loves them just like I do. Uh, when she comes in here to the store, man, she always has her phone. She's like, "Bio dude, you, 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 you like, gotta see, you, you gotta see what my crew's been doing." And uh -huh. I don't know, it's great. All right, so say we wanted to, somebody wanted to get involved with Emerald Tree Skinks. Uh, how do you, how do you plug into a community? How do you get your first emeralds? They are imported on the regular, I think it's twice a year when that, when, when Indonesia comes in. Okay. They are normally imported, I think at around $40 a pop. Uh, and then I think they're sold for around 75 to hundred bucks a pop. So wild caughts are tough for multiple reasons. Number one, they're already adults taken from their group, if they had a group. Number two, they're wild caught, so they're dehydrated. They are filled with worms, um, and they are not as forgiving to entry level keepers mistakes like any other wild caught reptile. Mm -hmm. Number three, you have absolutely no idea what that animal was eating in the wild. Um, especially given the fact that they live in the, towards the, the bottom end of the under canopy, where there ain't crickets, there ain't roaches. There's flies and mosquitoes and gnats and stuff like that. So when I got a wild, got some wild caught specimens, I had obviously, you know, we, my wife and I, we panicured, metro, quarantined, fecal, another fecal, lactated ringer soaks, um, or sorry, uh, you know, uh, soaking um, uh, every day for a week after we got them. Uh, and starting off with different types of like the, like the Pangea diet. Um, they, the wild caughts for some reason went nuts for the Pangea red with insects. I had, a, I had huge success getting wild caught emeralds that didn't really want to eat crickets right away to eat that. So then what I started doing was taking the, I took some of the powder, the Pangea red with insects, I put it in my mortar and pestle. And I grinded it down to a finer powder and I dusted the crickets with it. Well, that fixed all those problems. Okay. And then those adults went and got hooked on those crickets. Um, I don't know if anybody else has tried that. Um, that has personally like worked for like you know when we would have hognose snakes that somehow like you know some client got it a wild caught madagascan and it only eats freaking frogs mm -hmm. and she's like what am i supposed to do and i'm like well here we're gonna we're 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 gonna take this adult mouse and let's rub it on this pac-man frog a little bit and we're gonna see if that if, if that if that makes a difference so I digress, I'm sorry. Um, but that is, you know, if you're gonna get the wild caught, you really need to be prepared to put the money out in vet care and you need to quarantine them because they will be filled with a bunch of nasties. After they clear your quarantine process, 
that's when you can start introducing the group together. Don't introduce the group in quarantine. I, you want to quarantine them all separate. As much as it might pain you or cost mm -hmm. you more money, you want to quarantine them separate. And then once that tank is set up and acclimated, then you can introduce them and see how they do. Um, I, you know, but what I can tell you, if you, if you reach out to me and we don't have them, we captive bred ones. We don't sell, well, I won't sell wild caught ones unless I bring some in for a person like me who's trying to really establish captive breeding program, kind of like what, what my small okay. little niche group is doing yeah. right now. Um, you know, I think we sell our babies for around like 90 to a hundred bucks a pop. You know, I wasn't trying to have them be really expensive, um, as because you need, you want to get a couple of them. So, but at the same time, they're the cheap part. Buying the lizards themselves yes. is the cheapest part of yes. keeping them. They're set up. If you go with an 18 by 18 by 24 and you set them up right with all their lighting and what they need, you're looking at at least 350 to 400 bucks. If you're not buying wholesale, if you're buying, paying normal retail prices, that is what you are going to expect to pay to take care of babies living in an 18, 18, 24. Now if, you, now, if you have adults and you bought a group of adults from a reptile show and you are lucky enough, you did your quarantining and you're worming and they're doing great and they're ready, you know, your 36, 18, 36, that thing's gonna cost you 400 bucks just to start. So it's pretty safe to say that for a wild caught adult group that you have acclimated and got better, your setup uh, going retail will likely cost you close to six to 700 dollars. Now, when you're talking about these cages, you're talking about the glass vivariums, correct? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. um, I I haven't seen anybody keep them in screen cages. Now, I don't want to dissuade anybody from keeping them in screen cages. But if you do, you really want to make sure that you're able to give them their humidity swings. Yeah, so yeah. I'll dissuade people. I'm just ma I'm mentioning that because we're talking to chameleon okay. people. But I'll dissuade you. Don't. Not Appreciate the that. <laughs> yeah, you, you want to keep um, them humidity up for these guys. Exactly. So there is a new company com that came out called Leap that yep. has these new enclosures that look awesome, and I think they're making big ones that are kind of they kind of look like like these collapsible things. But those types of cages, they make a bigger one. Something like that would work as well. Mm -hmm. It just uh, it just kind of comes down to a what you have space for, and b what you want, and see how much you're willing to spend on it. Yeah, well. How established are uh, emerald tree skinks in herpetoculture? Uh, how many breeders do we hmm. have? How established is it? And if imports okay. stopped tomorrow, how long would they last? That's a really good question. It's easy to find wild caught ones at the show, but when it comes to like captive bred babies, it's tough. It's more along the lines of to get them to get a captive bred population really a foothold into the community it's finding keepers who are willing to put down that initial investment and the initial amount of patience it's going to take to get you to that next level every once in a while you know you'll see you know a baby on morph market you know, but it's never a consistent thing. It's always just an individual keeper that probably bought a pair of cap of wild caught ones and they laid eggs and then, oh, here's a baby and I'm gonna sell it type of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, it's really hard for me to come up on the top of my head other people that have them. I wish they yeah. did. In the chameleon community, we're dealing with that, trying to establish species and it's, it's oh, a challenge. And and Real maintaining challenge. locales so that way people don't muddy up the the unique evolutionary niche gene pools like the like the, the panthers have like and the, you know i can you know that's that's yeah. your realm not mine sorry Did, uh, <laughs> are, are there different locales of emerald tree skinks to, oh to my knowledge no there isn't okay. any right. like any any different locales or anything is there any special care of the babies so besides the fact that you need to miss them more and that de that de they dehydrate quickly. Um, really, it's paying attention to them eating enough. 
Okay. Um, paying attention to making sure that they're not the, the biggest killer of babies is, is Bill is is dehydration. Because if you don't miss that tank for one day and your soil isn't like nice and humid throughout the entire thing, they once they dehydrate because their bodies are so freaking tiny, they just they just don't seem to recover as quickly as compared to like a baby leopard gecko and you know that makes sense because they're from afghanistan you know they're used to being being thirsty you know the the, the you know these little babies are living in the rainforest where there's you know water available and epiphytes and other things like that so they continually have options so cap onto that like with the adults give your babies opportunity zones in the form of options don't skimp out on your lighting. Spend the money on the lighting. Supplement, varied diet, they will thrive for you. Okay, do you know how long it takes before they're sexually mature? Gator didn't rock and roll until he was a little under two years, I wanna say. My girls, two and a half years, give or take, yeah. I wanna say, could be a little bit less than that because I could, uh, they could have been laying dud eggs for all I know, because I just kind of let them, let them thrive in their enclosure and I just reap the benefits of what I'm getting out of them <laughs> thriving. Do you have any sense for how old they get? How long do they live? Yeah, how I long haven't, do they live? Oh man, like I said, I, I in my entire career, I have only lost one adult. Um, and she was, she was six, five or five and a half, six years old. She was one of the earlier ones that I got. But then here's Gator, who's like eight years old. I would not be surprised if you get a healthy twelve years out of a healthy, a healthy little lizard like that. That okay. that wouldn't surprise. That wouldn't surprise me, especially if you take care of them the right way. Okay. So it's well. a commitment. Where Not can... like a tortoise commitment. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's out of hand. <laughs> Where could people go to find out more information about Emerald Tree Skinks? So, uh, so on my website, I'm pretty sure we still have it up. We do have an Emerald Tree Skink like blog, and I do have a couple of videos on my YouTube channel, like my warehouse tours and things like that. Um, we, uh, on online, um, uh, I believe Mariah at Reptophiles, she also has a little bit of a tidbit about them with when it comes to animals with instinctual learning, um, and operant condition learning. I believe there's a small tidbit about them. Um, and this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if they, uh, if someone was interested in getting on the waiting list for any of your babies, yep. where would they contact you? Oh, it's really easy. You can just reach out to me at my website, uh, customercare@thebiodu.com. You can call us, um, and then you'll talk to one of the girls. We'll tell you how long our waiting list is. And honestly, if the waiting list is, I think, I honestly, I don't even know. But the last I checked, there was uh, like twenty people on there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but we just had like 10 or 12 babies like relinquished out and one guy bought five I think the other person bought three and the other person bought three or something like that. So um, If we ever run into that situation, we'll direct you to Michael or we'll direct you to Alyssa or we'll direct you to Sean you know, so that way you might have an opportunity from them even if you have to get on a waiting list from them it's it's still a start, I guess. Is it yeah, and, and I'm just going to say public service announcement from me. Uh, it's worth it to get captive bred. And I oh, personally yeah. am happy to get on waiting lists and wait for six months and pay three times as much uh, as, as I could get in a wild caught immediately because yep. the experience is night and day different. It's worth it. Get yourself on that uh, waiting list. While you're waiting, set up the cage. Let it uh, let the plants grow and uh, let it mature, and and then it'll be ready for your baby babies 
when they're available. It's, it's worth it. Yeah. This is not an immediate gratification hobby. It is a long-term enjoyment and, and a lifestyle hobby. Planning, so, investing, and yeah, let it be that way. And learning. Yep. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. Yeah. You want to make sure you mentioned letting things settle X, Y, and Z. They love isopods. Oh, they good. love hunting down every single one. Like your larger isopods that are like the size of your thumbnail. Okay. Your emeralds will clean house. <laughs> they will they will know they're in there and they will clean it out to when there's none left. It's if you're when you see their enclosure, you wanna go with your dwarf species like your dwarf whites or dwarf okay. purples because they will just be eradicated. I thought I should. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh. I want to thank you so much for coming on Absolutely. and introducing us to this incredible species. Uh, what What do you have in What do you have planned in your future regarding emerald tree skinks? So that big, beautiful four sided enclosure that Zach and I built, or that Zach built, that we're trying to launch for our commercial line. Uh, we're going to get Gator and his crew moved into that giant enclosure. Um, what I eventually plan on doing is uh, Mike, uh, with his multiple bloodlines, uh, he actually, from my understanding, he actually got another section, or sorry, another bloodline. So what I'm trying to do is get a third. So that way I'll have, uh, or a third group, excuse me. So I'll have mixed bloodlines of three entirely different groups here. Um, my goal is to produce close to 250 babies a year, okay. um, you know, routinely. Uh, but again, that, that comes with time and that comes with money and that comes with execution appropriately with just, not just with them as a species here, but my business as well. So, but that, that is what we're trying to strive for, for this year is to really up those numbers to make them be more available. So that way we don't have to have a waiting list. But we do, we do. Um, and as well as really continue to use them as an image to start educating people on different types of operant conditioning that you can do with reptiles to signify varying levels of intelligence. So one thing in my showroom that we're doing is like I'm getting like zoo grade plaques for all of my animals, like okay. nice metal ones. Yeah. Um, and a big thing that I'm trying to do with this new display cage that I'm going to got is that I'm getting is like literally talk about their story of how we train them to give them the response that we wanted um, and how you can correlate that with your kids with other animals that they're keeping whether it's you know leopard geckos or a beard a good example would be a bearded dragon you know beardies kind of just sit there but you can get them to do specific things if you work with them enough. So it's all about reinforcing that human-animal bond uh, with entry-level keepers, even if they're not keeping them. Because then at the end of the day, those animals that they're keeping are going to get a better standard of care, in my opinion. So, you know, that's what we're about here. So that's another thing that we're really trying trying to do here at BioDude. Because again, like they... They seem like they're really, really smart critters. Like they seem like they're really, really freaking smart. And it's it's really neat to be able to keep something like that and to again, reap the benefits of it. Well, I think I'd like to explore that. You have spent a long time. You've been working with them for a long time, have quite yeah. the group and are working on expanding it. And it sounds like you just have an incredible passion for these guys. I love them. They're what so is cool. it? that speaks to you so deeply? Honestly, I think what the first time I saw them, I never saw them before. I like when I saw those adults on Mike's table, I was like, dude, what is that? You know, and he's like, oh, I was like, I'm Josh, and I'm Mike, and then he was telling me about them, and I was just, I was freaking blown away because it's, it's a green lizard, but it, they just look they they just look different but honestly what what blew me away the most is raising my babies like my first ever ones that i got from to raise them up and to literally have them understand that it's me 
to, or maybe not understand that it's me, but there's some type of recognition that there's a human here. This is what I want that human to do. <laughs> it really just reinforces why I like reptiles so much because people don't give them any credit for really anything. Um, and, you know, my missions, and they are a definition that correlates with my business's mission statement. And they are an extremely good flagship animal for me to be able to use to have other people understand what I'm seeing in them as a species. Mm. But honestly, to answer your question is how much fun they are. Okay. It's really cool to see a reptile get excited to see you. It's yeah. like a tortoise. Yeah. His, name's, his name's Jesse Rothhacker, uh, Forgotten Friend, Reptile Sanctuary in uh, Lidditz, Pennsylvania. When you go outside to go see his tortoise, it would run. <laughs> All right, running isn't right, but he would crawl his way towards you as fast as he could. And you know, do you know what he'd do? Stick his neck oh. out for chin scratches. <laughs> and if you did not chin scratch him, he would bowl into you, bowl into you, <laughs> bowl into you until you gave him chin scratches. That is learning. Mm -hmm. That is that is that is taking like the information that they're getting from experiences and having a memory. People don't think that reptiles and birds, we know birds can, you know, but that they're not capable of memory or um, different, again, I keep saying like varying like different types of intelligence, but like they are like super intelligent animals. They're just really intelligent in a different way than what we are. And I just, it's really, really, really cool to see. And honestly, dude, when I'm talking to people and I just open up my cage and Gator just, <laughs> or one of my girls just hops on my shoulder and takes a wax worm out of my hand. Yeah. Those little kids, man, they lose their mind. And they, and they now have a big appreciation for what we're trying to do here. Yeah. And it's all about inspiring the young minds to change our hobby for the better as it progresses these next dozens of years. Yep. Sounds good. It's an excellent yeah, philosophy. Yeah. And Gator, you're now an ambassador to the reptile world. All right, Josh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. And uh, we'll see you next time. I appreciate the opportunity, Bill. Thank you so much.